Good morning. Is there any place you'd rather be than in worship this morning? Amen. Amen. What a wonderful morning we are having. Um, how many folks think it's going to rain later today? My niece says yes. Anybody else? Okay. Let's see. Announcements. The August uh, mission uh, is special offering is for in gathering, and um, clothing closet is still in need of infant clothing sizes newborn to 12 months. Uh, especially girls. I'm assuming that's still good. No one's arguing with me? Yep, bring in the clothes. Okay, and uh, uh, Reaching and Receiving says um, that, number one, the little cards, vi visitor cards, they should be in your pews. Okay, there's one right there. They say if you are here visiting, they want to make sure that you get one of those filled out and take it to the welcome desk out here so that people can greet you and, and, and give you a mug with some cool information in it. Because uh, we just want to know you were here and celebrate this uh, opportunity for a new relationship. Also, the mugs. Anybody have a mug here? Uh, yeah, hold it up real there. <laughs> Coffee in a sanctuary. Heaven will be like this. The mugs, they still have a, uh, some mugs that uh, are available for sale, and they still have the, the new design for the, uh, the Manchester Methodist Church t-shirts. Um, do we have all sizes? We have all sizes. Outstanding. So uh, if you'd like to buy a t-shirt, I think the mugs are six bucks and the shirts are ten. All right, there you go. And believe it or not, that's all we have for announcements this morning. Y'all, let's set our hearts and minds right and let us meet God in worship. Let us pray together. Lord, be with us this day, within us to purify us, above us to draw us up, beneath us to sustain us, before us to lead us, behind us to restrain us, around us to protect us. Please join in the opening hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, on page 62.
please join me in the opening prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like the cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord, will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. As we have received grace and love in Jesus Christ, let us share Christ's peace with one another. Amen. Jeff, you know in those moments when you finish announcements in one minute, you think you're overachieving and everything's perfect, and then you realize you forgot two important announcements, so I'm going to throw them out very quickly. Uh, number one, the Ice Cream Social at the Good Neighbor Home starts today at 11.30, so if you'd like to go and support that, that would be wonderful. And coffee today, our fellowship time will be happening in the garden, so we can enjoy all the labors that the garden crew uh, making it beautiful. And with that, I will stop interrupting worship. <laughs> Okay, the first scripture today is from the book of Deuteronomy. I invite you to turn in the Bible or the Pew Bibles. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> Listen, you heavens, and I will speak. Hear, you earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching fall like rain, and my words descend like dew like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our Lord, of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just as he. Things to teach you this year. 
So it's going to be one of the best years yet. But you know, there's a few things that aren't packed in your book bag that you need to take with you. So I thought I would remind you, because I'm sure your mom will, and one of them is your manners. Make sure you take your manners along with you, okay? And encouragement. Your mom and dad are gonna say, you can do it. And your teacher's gonna say, you can do it. So you just need to know. Okay, we're all rooting for you. The other thing you need to do is you need to continue to share. Remember, your parents are probably always telling you at home you have to share, but when you go to school, it still continues. Okay. And you want to put on a smile. Now, I know that you and your mom and dad, you walk out of the door, they're going to be maybe seeing some tears, and some of them are going to be jumping up and down. <laughs> but put on your smile, put on your happy face because you're going to have an exciting year and to put on a positive attitude. Now, one of the things that I always had trouble with was having the confidence to know that I could do it. And you know, all these adults out here today know that you are going to be able to do it. That with God's help, he's watching over you and your parents are praying for you, the teachers are praying for you, and the people out here in the congregation are all praying for you to have a good year. Uh, you know, I used to have dreams, I used to have fears that I wouldn't find my classroom. That for some reason, I kept having this dream that I couldn't find my algebra classroom and it would take me all day running up and down the stairs. Now maybe that's because I wasn't very good at algebra. But I would never find the door to my algebra classroom. And somehow I still got a grade. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> isn't that funny? I still have those dreams today sometimes. I have those fears. But you know what? We're gonna tear those fears up because you need to go to school with confidence because God is watching over you. Now, I have something, to, we're gonna see how much confidence Pastor Phil and Dean, my husband. You both need to come up. We're gonna tear away their fears. And we're gonna see how much confidence they have. Okay, <laughs> Dean, these are for you. Some good gloves. Pastor Phil, these are for you to assist Dean, be his assistant. What's dangerous? <clears throat> well, remember, we just tore up fear, so you've got to be brave. Now, we were at a church camp a couple weeks ago, and one of the pastors came across a small rattler. And so we're going to, I thought it would be fun to sh share this morning. And so anyway, Pastor Phil, I want you to just keep the small rattler in place while Dean picks it up, if you would please. <laughs> okay. Now, Pastor Phil, you just, Put your thumbs on the rattler so it doesn't move, so Dean can pick it up. Okay, all right. I want you to show it with the to the kids. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, good job. Small rattler. So so sometimes. What we think is going to be scary really isn't. So anyway, thank you guys. You were so brave. So let's join hands. We're going to join hands and sing.
save for it, okay? Did you really think I'd put a rattler in there? It's me. No. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask the blessings upon these children as they go off to New Year's school. We ask your blessings to open their minds and their hearts to new adventures and new ideas. And we are so very, very proud of them. And we ask for you, the support of the parents and the teachers as they also act as an encouragement and teaching the children the lessons that they need to learn. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. That's going to be hard to follow up. <clears throat> Our second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 28 to 34. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If, God, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. switching to Geico. I would not wear that lace. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes can save you 15 percent or more. I will tell you that I spent a bunch of time looking at uh, runway shows, you know, because I was going to show something for, you know, the, the, the wackiness, the things that we wear. And I had to go to a Geico commercial because they don't wear much at those shows, I discovered. <laughs> I'm waiting for somebody to you know, like, go look at my computer. Pastor, what have you been doing? Anyway, and I also would like to bring up from Jackie's um, children's message two things. Uh, one, children, when they ask to share, remember homework's included. That person one day might be your pastor, just letting you know. And um, the second thing, it is not fun to play with me in snakes. I'll just tell you that now. My wife's over here going, oh yeah. She has a great story about a dead one in the closet one time she'll share with you. Um, so uh, what I liked most about the commercials, I looked at it, uh, other than it was silly and that made me happy, was uh, when she says, I would not wear that lace. And he says, well, I don't know. And I'm thinking, dude, you got the legs, go for it. You know, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, so why? worry about our clothes. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us, this opportunity for us to be here and share in joy and laughter, and also in hope and dreams and in sorrow. Lord, we've come here to just rest in you, to be refilled, to be encouraged. Lord, meet us here. Help us to listen for your still and quiet voice. And Lord, as I lead in this time, allow me to diminish so that you may be revealed all the more. Lord, we love you. Amen. <clears throat> so why do we worry about our clothes? 
I was at Mall of America with my wife last week. We went to the Twins game, and we had to have something to do Friday during the day, so we went to, a tw went to the Mall of America. She'd never been there. I've learned a couple of things. I don't need to go back with her, is one. <laughs> <clears throat> she was so had she had her Fitbit on, and she's like, do you know we walked 11 miles today? My knees are the size of cantaloupes, and I'm like, yeah, I'm with you. I got that, okay? <clears throat> have you, uh, how, who here has been to Mall of America, okay? Well, apparently, it's just not that unique a place. Uh, how does multiple floors of clothing stores stay in business? How can there be that many choices? Have you stopped to think about it? I mean, everybody in there, and, and the stores all look nice. There wasn't an empty spot in the place, and it's just full of clothes. Oh, except for one in particular shoe shop that my wife walked in, and angels sang, and I took a nap in the chair as she wandered. Um, <laughs> do we really need that much stuff? Seriously? I mean, that is an enormous amount of, of consumer choices, isn't it? You know, I'm one of these guys who, you know, I, everything I wear, I buy at Norby's. And I like it that way, okay? <laughs> Norby's is where everything can happen. I can get a wrench, I can get an oil filter, and I can buy a cool shirt in one place. That's the place you want to be. So, anyway. Um, see how God has dressed the world. There are flowers. There are sunsets. There are vistas. There are rivers. There are seas. There are football stadiums. The world is full of beauty. When you think about it, there is nothing that we can create that will beat a, sun, a sunset or a fall sunrise. There's nothing that we create that will take your breath away, such as maybe the Grand Canyon or other beautiful Vista scenes. God has dressed the world in an amazing way, and yet we still have anxiety over how we look. Let us not forget the question that Psalm 8 asks, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Is not mankind... Through Jesus' sacrifice and grace, did he not share his own righteousness with us? What more do we need to know to understand that God's love is abundant beyond our imagination? I want you to set the Wayback Machine to 1984, December 1984, okay? We, uh, you can't leave for a bowl game. Uh, the football teams can't leave for bowl games, uh, January 1st bowl games, until uh, December 26th, Okay? So what do we do? Coach Osborne says we're leaving at midnight on Christmas Day, okay? That just sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But he was nice, we had practice in the morning and we were just gonna you know, be done before noon and then when people could run and you know, spend time with family and, and then get back for the midnight flight, right? That makes sense, okay? Only apparently we didn't practice well and made Coach Osborne cranky, okay? So he calls an afternoon practice. So we're going to practice at 2.30. Now, as, we, as we're going through this schedule, my girlfriend at the time, who I, I thought quite highly of, she did that terrible thing. Guys, you're all going to, I want some head nodding here. We're, you're going to be with me. She says, oh, you're not leaving till midnight. You have the whole afternoon and evening. You know what you can do? You can come and meet the family. Oh, God. Okay, those are terrible words, okay? What, I, who wants to do that? And so I'm like, oh no, you know, and now we have this afternoon practice and I'm supposed to meet at her father's parents' house at five o'clock for dinner and we had 2.30 practice. I didn't get out of practice till 4.45. I got 15 minutes to get from Lincoln, Nebraska to, to into, into town in Omaha. Things aren't looking good, right? And this is before cell phones, okay? So I just wanna point out this wasn't my fault, all right? So I jump in my truck and I'm flying down the highway and I run up behind this long string of traffic, okay? And they are going, and I mean impeccably, perfectly, the speed limit. <laughs> or otherwise, the polite suggestion on the side of the road, okay? And I'm losing my mind because I'm so late. So I finally jump in the other lane and take off and I'm flying down and I pass the front car of that string, said good afternoon, officer, okay? <laughs> He looks over at me, kind of surprised. I'm dropping a gear and speeding off, and I think he figured, well, he must have a good reason. 
because he let me go. Okay, just so you know, God was with me. So I get to Debbie's father's father's house, Grandpa Dvork, and, and I walk in, and I've missed dinner, but they kept the plate for me, which was nice. And he walks up, and he says, so you're Phil. Okay, you got to know, Lou is a, he's a great guy. He's about this tall, and he had the lowest voice known. You know, it's like, so you're Phil. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, and he's like this tall and intimidating. Okay, you know what I mean? And, and he says, uh, have a beer, okay? I'm like, no, sir, no, thank you. You know, I kind of got to uh, get on the airplane this afternoon or this evening, and you know, I'm not quite legal. I'm pretty sure Dr. Tom would probably have a problem with it. I'm going to go with no. <laughs> ah, here, okay? So he hands me a beer. I look at the beer. Of course, I didn't want to drink it. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So when he wasn't looking, I set it over behind the piano. You know, I'm just going to let this thing go quietly. He walks up and says, you don't have a beer. Gets me another one. Okay. So I'm like, okay. When nobody was looking, I poured it in the ficus. Okay. I'm not really sure how it turned out. A few minutes later, he comes up and says, man, you're out of beer already. Hands me another one. Right. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Uh, we were there for like an hour and a half and he'd handed me like seven beers. Okay. And I, every time I'm looking at Debbie, I'm like, do something. And she's like, no, this is funny. Yeah. You're uncomfortable. This is great. <laughs> and, and so I left the house thinking the next time that grandma cleans, she's going to be doing what is Phil doing, wasting all these beers. But I'm pretty sure it was like hams or something. So it was okay. Um, so we leave there and I'm like, okay, you know, and we go over to Debbie's mother's house, the grandparents' dodrill. And we walk in and I meet Debbie's brother. Debbie's littlest brother, his name's David. At the time, he was maybe 14, okay? And uh, you know how brothers are with sisters? Just tortures them, right? Everybody understand that? His sister brought home a corn husker, okay? So her stock had gone up, all right? And he just sat there, and he's like, what's the locker room like? What's the weight room like? What's the cleats like? What are the socks like? I mean, it's just, you know, crazy stuff. And I'm answering his questions, you know? And, and we have dessert, and then it's time for gifts, and Woody, Debbie's grandfather, is at the tree, which is about where the sound booth is from me. And I'm sitting on these steps to go down into the living room. I've got Debbie on one side and her ever-questioning brother on my other side, right? And the conversation's going, the conversation's going, then I hear this fill. And I look up, and I get smashed in the face by this cookie tin, okay? And I'm like, dude! And he's like, uh, Debbie's grandmother looks at him, she goes, Woody! And Woody says, what? He's a football player. And I said, yeah, I'm a lineman. <laughs> so she had made me cookies for the flight. And they were delicious. I could have used something cold for the lump, but that was okay. <laughs> and, I, and, and that was, you know, then I leave there and, you know, I, I get, to, get to the airport in time to, to get on the plane. And I think of this day... Uh, the story came to mind as I was reading the scripture because <clears throat> why do we worry about things? Why do we worry about what we're, what we're going to drink? Beer comes out of the woodwork. Why do we worry about what we're going to eat when cookies fall from the sky? Okay? <clears throat> we worry about everything like we have control, which I think is funny. <clears throat> Jesus says, you have little faith. We've seen Jesus heal the sick. We've seen the lame walk and the blind see. He's even walked on water. And yet we still don't believe. We struggle to truly believe. We focus on the stuff that we want. And we spend so much time chasing these dreams. Don't we? We don't trust that God will take care of it. Because it's all right, Lord. We'll take care of ourselves. The district superintendent at the East Central District, his name is Kaboko, and he grew up in the Congo. And I love to listen to Kaboko, okay? Um, his, English is his second language, but he speaks it pretty darn well. But this is a man who, when he breaks into prayer, you have an experience with the divine, okay? And he can tell you what it's like to have to trust in God for tomorrow's meal. He can tell you what it's like to wake up in the morning and say, Dear Lord, help me feed these children today. I don't know what I'm going to do. Only to find a way through the day to bring dinner home. He understands what it means to trust in God. We don't. 
what am I going to feed these kids? Open the cupboard and there's multiple choices. This is our reality. Our reality is, is that we've become so individualized and so independent that God is, it's nice, to, God's nice to have around. The whole salvation thing's kind of cool. But do we recognize God's action in our providence? That's my question. Do you believe? Do you really, really believe that God will care for you? What is man that you care so deeply for them? We don't. We struggle with this. But it's not new to us. It's obviously something that's been going on for at least a couple thousand years. This is not about mindlessly moving forward and trust God to meet all our needs. We don't just um, wake up in the morning, go forth with our day, knowing that when we sit down, somehow a pot roast will appear in front of us. That's not what it's about. There's nothing wrong with working hard. There's nothing wrong with saving. There's nothing wrong with planning for the future. This is what responsible people do. And God has made, it, made us capable of that kind of planning. It's when those things become more important than our faith that we have a problem. It's when we move from a time of preparation into a time of obsession. That is when it's a problem. It's when we move beyond enough and yet still hunger for more. That's when it becomes a problem. Okay? That's really what he's talking about here. Responsibility demands that we prepare, but it's in faith that we trust that our preparations will be enough. Being responsible is knowing the difference between enough and too much. Do not forget the things of eternal value in our labor for abundance. What has eternal value? Our relationships with God, our relationships with family, and our relationship with neighbor. That's eternal. What else is eternal? Nothing. Nothing you can buy at Mall of America, which I trust you can buy virtually anything at Mall of America. There's nothing you can purchase there that has eternal value. There's nothing that you can gain of eternal value by spending one more hour at work. There's nothing you can gain of eternal value by spending one more time working out or preparing for the game. This is a part of our lives and it's fun and, and it helps us in our lives. But when it becomes we're giving an hour here only to rob an hour there with God family and friends that we've gone too far how much is enough does that make sense but Phil I don't know what the market's going to do when I retire sure don't and no one ever does but Phil um, you know I, I got to make sure that when I retire I have enough imagine the people that retired in 07 in the crash of 08 right we can plan and we can plan and we can plan and we can obsess and we can be anxious and we can do all these things, but what eternal value does it provide to us? That's the question. Be responsible, prepare, but leave time. And not some time, not a little bit penciled in. Leave quality time. For things eternal. God will take care of you. God will make the circumstances such that it's all going to work out. Phil, how can you be so sure? Another story. We're running down to Katrina shortly after the hurricane. Okay, and I got a team of about, oh, I think there were 90 some of us. Okay, and the church that we were going to stay in, they had 88 bucks. So we had a few on the floor, but we were going to be okay. All right? We arrived to find out that the chaos of a disaster had had them make a couple of minor errors. And they had booked three other groups into the place. There were 228 people staying in this church with 88 bunks. Okay? They had promised that there would be a site supervisor who would assign the work. 
and a case manager who would be doing the assessments. We arrive, and they said, here they are. And it was a desk in a room that had stacks of files this tall all over the place. And they said, there you go. There's, there's, there's your people that you need to help. But there's thousands. Who's, gonna, who's, who's made the priority list? Who has matched the skills of the teams with the needs of the families? Go get them, Pastor. Okay? And, and so here we were, and somehow I was elected to lead all five teams. Okay? So I came in with 90 people to supervise, and now I have 228. Okay? And one of them was a group of Texans. They were fun. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> and... Uh, so we arrive and, and we're getting ready for worship and, and that's kind of a big deal on mission trips for me. We make a big deal about our worship. And so I've got to, between when we arrive and worship, I've got to grab a handful of files and I take off and I'm, I don't know the town and, and I got a map and I'm looking at houses and I'm meeting people and trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with my teams. And then we come back and we have worship. And then after worship, I take the team leaders in and I hand out their folders. Here's what you're going to be doing. Okay? And then, oh, I forgot to mention, we, we come back on Saturday and I leave Sunday for seminary. And I had papers due. And so I had homework. And so then I finished with all that at 12.30. And then I would till 2.30 work on my homework. Okay, and then at 5 a.m. we were up, and we got to work to got to head into the sites. And at 3 o'clock we finished the sites, and I got everybody back, jumped in another vehicle, took off with an armload of files and my map, and scouted out the next day for all these teams. Okay, and this went on for nine days, and I got three hours of sleep a night. Okay. On the bus ride down, they said, okay, you guys are gonna be doing framing. I said, okay, so we'd raided the tool closet and I had everybody bring their tools and I've got a trailer full of framing tools. We're about three hours outside of town when they called and said, change, we're drywalling. <laughs> we'll make that work, okay? So when we get there, I've gotta go raid the warehouse for more tools. This is the way it is. This is the way it works on a disaster site. I'm telling you that I spent a year planning everything. The meals, the worships, the potential sites, the teams, the team leaders, so that they, they could, you know, I had, I had drywalling teams and I had framing teams because I had the people in place. And we arrive and everything changes, okay? Everything. In the worships, uh, there was another pastor from St. Paul's that had gone with us and the utter despair of the people in the community, she just got overwhelmed and she wasn't participating in worship and she was supposed to be doing every other sermon. So in the midst of all this, somewhere around three in the morning, I'm starting to think about tomorrow night's worship and trying to come up with a sermon, okay? It was crazy, it was out of control. And at the end, I had a group of adults that had come with us and they said, my God, how did you stay so calm through all that? I mean, we get back, you start the volleyball game, you get all the kids playing, and then you took off and you went and found sites, and then you would do this, and you would do that. And we had a, a person whose brother was killed in a tractor accident while we were there. And we had no way to get her back before the bus was gonna get back. So I had to sit with her for a day and a half as she dealt with that. How do you stay so calm? Well, I'll tell you, as I plan for these things, I plan for my plan to fail, okay? That is, that is the best way for it to work. I plan for my plan to fail. And then I plan for my plan B to fail. And then when I get to plan C, I step back and say, whatever happens, I'm gonna have the resources that are needed. I've just gotta be cool and put them into place. This isn't that hard. And even though everything was going wrong and everything was changing and, okay, I gotta tell the story, I wasn't going to, but I had a guy from Illinois, okay? And he was chainsawing a tree that was broken and was hanging down over a house. And the tree's here and the branch goes this way and he set his ladder here <laughs> and he cut it. 
and he dropped 15 feet with a blazing chainsaw, okay? And he spent six days in the hospital. It was really tragic. That happened. Y'all, I don't know of a better way to say to you, we can do our best for planning, but things are gonna change. So just plan for your plan to fail and trust in God that the resources will be made available. That's all we can do, isn't it? I'm not telling you to be irresponsible and walk without a plan. I'm telling you that what we need to do is not to be anxious about the plan and not to be crushed when the plan doesn't work, but instead, trust God. The resources will be there. How do I know? Look at the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. If he cares so much for that, which does not worship, how much more will he care for humanity? This is my point. Do not forget that things of eternal value in this labor for abundance, which is our family, friends, and most important time with Jesus. Pagans set aside these things to chase prosperity to the detriment of all other things. And Jesus says, point blank, don't be like them. Don't trade your tomorrow trying to make more of today. You don't want to miss out on the memories of your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, your friends, because those are what's eternal. Nothing you can buy at Mall of America is eternal. God knows your needs. Trust in God. Let God be the priority. Let God set the bar for what is enough. Seek first God's kingdom, and God's own righteousness will be freely shared with you. So do not worry about tomorrow. Things will change, but the responsible will adapt, and they will be blessed. Why worry? Each day comes with its own challenges. Look how many God has equipped you to overcome so far. Did you catch that at the end? Don't worry about tomorrow. Every day has challenges of its own. You made it here. God has equipped you to handle every challenge you've seen so far. You have little faith. Why do you doubt? Do you truly believe that God cares enough for you that he will make it possible for you to endure? And the answer is, how can you? I've seen the blind see. I personally have been there and watched the dead come to life. And yet we worry that God doesn't love us enough to make sure we have enough. Deuteronomy 32, chapter, uh, chapter 32, verse 2. Let my teaching fall like rain and my words descend like dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. Be of great faith. Trust in God. Let God's word wash over you like showers on the grass, abundant rain on tender plants. Let God's word encourage you. God chooses to meet us in the authority of the gospel. When we open the gospel and when we participate of its teachings, God meets us there. Do you believe that? Or are we of little faith? If God chooses to meet us in the words of the gospel, then the words of the gospel must be important. They must be like air that we breathe or water that we drink. They must be incredibly important. Otherwise, why would that be the place God chooses to meet us and to form a relationship with us? Let God's wisdom and word rain and descend like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. These flower pots that you see before you, they are representative of Jesus' garden. Last week, we talked about 
us being the soil and, and planted within the soil is God's own righteousness. <clears throat> Let God's word nurture and strengthen you. Place your trust in the gardener for your good and be good soil. Responsible for the righteousness planted within you. Look and see that there is new growth this week. Trust in Jesus so that you may continue to grow and blossom so that we may spread the fragrance of God's own righteousness in the world. No matter what I do, I cannot create life. You understand that, right? I can't create energy. I can harness energy. Humankind can harness energy, but we can't create it. We can move it from here and there. Or sometimes we can have it change forms, but we cannot create it. There stands the mystery of faith, people. The energy that turns our world, the energy that fuels our lives, this can only be of God. No matter how much I labor, no matter how much I own, I can't do that. If I can trust in God to harness the energy of life in me, why would I assume that he wouldn't care enough to see me succeed? We're all born in the different circumstances. Some of us are born on the wrong side of a line on a map. Some of us may be born looking different or speaking differently. Some of us may be good looking. Some of us not so much. Some of us may be born into abundance. Some are born into want. All these things are true. And at times, doesn't it seem a bit unfair? I know people who have labored their lives away, working hard and faithfully, barely to get by. And I've known people whose work weeks seem brief, and yet they succeeded well. I'm not here to tell you I understand it. I'm not here to say that, in my human opinion, it appears fair. I'm here to tell you that God is invested in you. And you will know enough if you act responsibly and you plan, and you plan for your plan to fail. And then step back and trust God to provide the resources to see you through because you're special. Don't you understand how special you are? God created you and said, this is good. So good that he placed his own image in you. So amazing that Jesus sacrificed himself so that you can know grace. And the seed of God's righteousness was planned in us. So when God looked down from above, he saw a reflection of Jesus. Because my righteousness will not be enough. People, we need Jesus. But we don't need Jesus as an afterthought. Or we don't need Jesus in those times only of crisis. Lord, save me. We need Jesus every day with every breath. And we can trust in that. If we humble ourselves and open ourselves up to what is enough and what is important. And what is important is what? Only the things eternal. The things of this world will eventually just go away. Amen? Let us stand and sing our hymn.
You may be seated. And now we come to that, my favorite time of service when we share joys and concerns one with another. What joys and concerns do we have as a family today? I will tell you about Judy, um, my Thursday visits. She's in a hospice house in Marion, and she's not doing real well. So let's keep Mary, uh, Judy in prayer and her husband now. Others? Yes? We pray for the peace of Charlotte Will uh, uh, Yeah, I don't know a lot about that situation. I, I kind of missed out on it because I was out of town over the weekend. But uh, I do understand that there were some Methodist pastors in the group that was struck by the car. Um, yeah, um, you know, wherever heat, heat, wherever hate resides, God is not there. And just remember that. God is not about hating things. And so white supremacy and all that foolishness. Um, Y'all, if the heart beats, the lungs work, the image of God dwells. Can I just make that really clear? Okay, I don't really care what color you are. I, I, there, I think there's hate groups all over the spectrum. But if the heart beats and the lungs breathe, the image of God dwells. And we do not need to live in a world that knows hate one for another. Because in each new relationship I've ever met, each new person I've ever gotten to know, I've gotten to know God better by experiencing their image the image of God in them. And, and the more people I know, especially from different cultures and different backgrounds, the bigger and greater God gets. I just will never understand that foolishness. Others? Yes, sir. Bill Williams, Bill Williams is healing. Needs, Needs healing. Okay, so let's keep Bill in healing prayers. Others? Y'all, let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Holy and loving God, we thank you for this time that you've given us to be here together as family. And Lord, we humble ourselves, we bow our heads, and we say, Lord, you are wonderful. Lord, we praise you for the ways that you have been made known in our lives, the abundance that we have known. Lord, we praise you even in times when our abundance seems to wane and our lives no want. Lord, we still praise you. We praise you for the healing grace that we have experienced with so many. And Lord, yet we praise you for those whose lives are nearing or coming to an end. For Lord, we know you are with them as well, prepared to take them to a place that you have specifically created for them with their feet beneath your kingdom table. Lord, you are amazing and wonderful. You care for us here in this place, and yet you build the bridge where we can be in relationship and you will care for us in eternity. Lord, we love you. We ask you to be with those on our hearts that are seeking to know you and healing grace at this time. We, seek you, we, we pray that you will be made known to those whose lives are coming to an end and to bring encouragement and peace to family. And Lord, help us to grow and mature. Help us to deepen our faith so that we trust you wholly and completely. Lord, we love you. Amen. And now if we can prepare to return to God a portion of the abundance we have received.
Lord, we are humbled, and we, we will never understand. Lord, in the midst of our human condition, you have found us worthy. You have shared with us grace. Lord, you have shared your own righteousness with us. Lord, we are so thankful. Oh, we are so grateful. Lord, we, we return these gifts to you so much that you have provided. We return this portion and say, Lord, let them grow. Let them grow and let them become energy and let that energy become light and let that light shine in the dark places of this world where, Lord, you seek to be made known. And Lord, we offer more than just these. We offer our very selves as well. Lord, let us be light bringers into the dark places of the world. But we recognize, Lord, that sometimes we are busy or tired or selfish. We don't always respond to your call. Yet, Lord, we understand that grace abounds and, and, and we are full and complete in your sight as we pray as you taught us. Our Father. What a wonderful morning of worship, and how blessed am I to have been able to share it with all of you today. Do not forget that we have fellowship in the garden, assuming it's not raining yet. My knee's still complaining. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these people, Lord, your people, our family. Lord, thank you for your presence. Lord, thank you for helping us to draw near. Lord, we just want 
to be your people. And we want all who see us to know that truly you are our loving God. So Lord, we pray that you will create in us to be vessels of your spirit so that others will experience you loving them through us. And Lord, let them say there is something special about Jesus. Lord, let them wish, let them desire to know you more. This is our prayer, Lord. We love you. Amen. Well, if, if it didn't ring, I wouldn't have seen the clock. I'd still be preaching. <laughs>